The Jewish Channel's Week in Review. A new film in Yiddish, staging a new Jewish drama, what these doors mean to Jewish history, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Congress should keep talking about increasing sanctions on Iran, but it should not actually increase sanctions on Iran. Those are reportedly the marching orders from the administration of President Barack Obama after a late October meeting at the National Security Council for Congressional Senior Staffers, according to a report by Ron Campius in the JTA. Campius writes, Participants said that the NSC unveiled findings showing that threats from Congress to enhance sanctions are keeping Iran at the negotiating table. But the NSC also argued that actually advancing a tougher sanctions bill could thwart progress toward a diplomatic resolution. A tougher sanctions bill already passed the House in July, and the question now is whether the Senate will take up such a bill, debate its passage, and possibly vote on it. In the midst of talks about Iran, there are plenty of people accusing others of heartlessness. Indeed, some might describe others as co-co-co cold-hearted, and if they did, they'd be heartened to know that the propagator of that phrasing, Paula Abdul, is celebrating her bat mitzvah at the Western Wall, according to the Times of Israel. As part of her trip to Israel, Abdul met with President Shimon Peres, to whom Abdul said, People, everyone's told me you are so sababa. <laughs> so sababa. And it's true. It's true. Sababa is a modern Hebrew word roughly equivalent to the contemporary use of awesome in English. Something that isn't so sababa in Israel is the escalation of conflict regarding local elections into threats of violence and now into actual violence. As we reported two weeks ago, disputes among ultra-Orthodox leaders led one faction to declare followers of the rival faction as subject to stoning. Well, it turns out it was that latter group that moved beyond threats. A 99-year-old rabbi was attacked in the middle of teaching a class by a 28-year-old yeshiva student. The attacked rabbi is one of the leading figures of ultra-Orthodoxy, Rabbi Aaron Lieb Steinman. Steinman had declared voting for his preferred ultra-Orthodox political party a requirement of Orthodox Jewish law. Meanwhile, an election here in the U.S. that has seen significant ultra-Orthodox involvement is that for Brooklyn District Attorney, in which incumbent Charles Joe Hines is running on the Republican and Independent lines after losing a Democratic primary to Ken Thompson. Hines is largely seen as in the pocket of ultra-Orthodox rabbis who fought against prosecution of abuse and other crimes in that community. Among the more recent conflicts in the campaign is the Yiddish language ad Heinz campaign placed in local newspapers and whether it employed a racist term to describe his African-American opponent. And now Heinz has received the endorsement of a leading rabbi who has made repeated statements on behalf of convicted pedophiles. Rabbi Yisrael Belsky, who heads the famous Yeshiva Torah Vadas and is one of the leading decisors for the Kosher Certification Division of the Orthodox Union, signed a letter from six leading rabbis in Brooklyn, declaring in part, It is our hope and prayer that Mr. Hines will receive your vote. Belsky in the past has vocally supported child predators and said victims of abuse should not call the police to report the crimes. The most recent example of his advocacy was the 2013 conviction of Rabbi Yosef Kolko, who pleaded guilty to sexually abusing a child he was counseling. Belsky issued many statements supporting Kolko as innocent, even after Kolko's guilty plea, and wrote in a letter supporting Kolko that, quote, The Jewish law is undisputed that one who informs upon a fellow Jew to secular law enforcement without first consulting a rabbi has no share in the world to come. But while many ultra-Orthodox leaders aren't doing much to combat sexual crimes through standard means, there's a new effort from one corner of the Hasidic world, a ban on soy and soy-based food products. The ban against the food products declares it is due to, as the blog Failed Messiah put it, fears that the hormones in soy foods will cause the bodies of young teen students to become feminine in appearance and thereby cause their rabbis and older students to become sexually aroused seeing them. But don't let statements like that color your views of all Yiddish speakers. The efforts to revive Yiddish through the arts continues in a new film, as Rebecca Honig Friedman reports. Canadian writer and director Naomi J. didn't start out wanting to make a film in Yiddish. But as she explained before the New York premiere of The Pin at the Anne Frank Center in Lower Manhattan, she felt the story she had written in English demanded it. There is something that brings you immediately into a time and place when you hear another language, and I was trying to make the film feel as authentic as possible. 
Was macht dein Hand? Fine. Lass mich geguckt haben. Nein, es ist gar nicht. Lass ab. Now playing in New York and L.A., The Pin, Jay's first feature film, is a love story that moves back and forth between the present and a past set in Lithuania in 1941. It tells the story of two Jewish teenagers who unexpectedly find themselves hiding from the Nazis together in a barn. In present-day North America, the boy, now an elderly man who works as a showmare, one who guards over dead bodies before they are buried, realizes the body he is sitting with belongs to his love from long ago. The Pin's producer, Daniel Beckerman, connected to the story on a familial level. Like in a way, this could have been my grandfather's story, who, as the war was starting to escalate, he walked from Poland to Belgium. However, Jay's initial inspiration for The Pin came not from a family story, but a more unlikely source, an American television show about a funeral home. I watched all of Six Feet Under, like, in a month, all five seasons, and I became fascinated with bodies, like what, what is it like to miss someone physically, not just miss their character, their soul, their spirit, but the physicality, what would that be like? The Yiddish part I came later, and the fact that Jay couldn't speak the language Man's wasn't a deterrent. But finding talented young actors familiar with Yiddish proved an insurmountable challenge. So instead, Jay looked for actors with a general facility for languages, and found Milda Gesaita and Grisha Pasternak, who both immigrated to Canada from Eastern Europe as adolescents. Neither is Jewish or had any familiarity with Yiddish. No knowledge of Yiddish. I didn't, know, I didn't even know it existed. But that didn't, didn't stop Gesaita from giving a performance that the New York Times called, quote, a revelation in its review of the pin. This is the first major role for both Gesaita and Pasternak, who was awed by seeing himself in the say, film's just poster. Like, I, I look at it and it's kind of difficult to believe that that, that right there is me. For more from the young actors of the pin, watch the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. Continuing with the Jewish arts, a new play examines the story of a pair of Holocaust survivors. Meredith Gansman has that story. You ever want to just get away and pack up, leave everything else in the past? It's a nice thought, but it's not always so simple. Donald Margulies' new play, The Model Apartment, it explores just that and how you can't always escape your past. At the opening night of The Model Apartment, which just completed a limited revival run off-Broadway, theater great Mandy Patankin raved about the performance. I, I swear to you, I'm not a good liar, so this isn't just because my wife is in this production. This is simply my favorite play I have ever seen and my favorite production of anything I've ever seen. While the play deals with themes of the Holocaust, it's not just a Holocaust play. It really is a play about parenting. It's about parenting parents and children. The parents in the model apartment are Brooklyn residents and Holocaust survivors Max and Lola, who find themselves in the eponymous model apartment when their contracted turnkey ready Florida condo turns out to be unready. Mark Bloom, who plays Max, says he appreciates the character's multiple dimensions. I guess the danger of, uh, uh, of doing, you know, a Holocaust play is that you as an actor, you, you, you're playing an idea. And, and I, I, can't, I don't really know how to play an idea, uh, or, or I, and I don't really want to play an idea, I want to play a person. These characters struggle to live with their story as survivors, as Catherine Grody, who plays Lola, explained. There's this the great quote about griefs when turned into stories lose some of their power to injure our hearts. And I think for Lola, making the Holocaust a story mm -hmm. distances her for a little bit. And it was her, the extraordinary thing that happened to her. So she can't quite embrace ordinariness because she had this extraordinary experience and I think she shares it uh, with her daughter as, you know, an extraordinary story. This family of characters carries the weight of the past, while the model apartment also questions how future generations will carry that weight. To see more from the model apartment, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Some of the most important documents in Jewish history were housed in a location often referred to as the Cairo Geniza. Now on exhibit is the actual housing of those documents, the doors of the synagogue in which the documents were found. Christian Neiden reports. This wood panel tells a story 
It's part of the door to the Torah Ark of the ancient Ben Ezra Synagogue, site of the 19th century archaeological find of the Cairo Geniza, a cache of documents whose discovery gave new insight into medieval Jewish life. Now a new exhibition at the Yeshiva University Museum, Threshold to the Sacred, the Ark Door of Cairo's Ben Ezra Synagogue, focuses not only on the door itself, but also Geniza documents, photographs of the synagogue, and works from Jewish and Muslim artisans all of which helped tell the tale of Cairo's long-ago Jewish community. This is a wood panel uh, that dates to the 11th century, so it's uh, about a thousand years old, that served as part of the uh, door to the Holy Ark that held the Torah scrolls in the Ben Ezra Synagogue, uh, so dating from the 11th century and probably served as the Ark door for uh, about 800 years into the 1800s. And it was in the 1800s that the Ben Ezra Synagogue gave the Jewish world the Egyptian Geniza, a repository with a thousand years worth of religious and secular documents. Rabbi Solomon Schechter was one prominent student of the Geniza in the 1890s. He then sent around 140,000 fragments of it to England for closer study. An act commemorated in this exhibition with a photo of Schechter working on the Geniza. Every uh, figure who uh, comes upon the Geniza in the 19th century, and there are others before Schechter who did, describe it as a, as a chaotic jumble of papers. And this is reflected in, uh, in the boxes that are there. Uh, the range of documents, everything from religious uh, to all kinds of different secular uh, documents were there, and as well as different materials as well, as there were wood fragments and, and paper. Perhaps the most precious papers in this exhibition are those that hold the handwriting of one of history's greatest Jewish scholars. These are two original draft uh, manuscripts uh, in the hand of Moses Maimonides, uh, the Rambam, uh, one of the great intellectual, uh, religious uh, figures uh, of, of, of Jewish history, uh, and the uh, spiritual uh, head, the leader of the Egyptian Jewish community. And these are two manuscripts, one of his major philosophical text, The Guide for the Perplexed, uh, over here, written in Judeo-Arabic, which was the language he most frequently used uh, for his writing. To see more from Threshold to the Sacred, on display now through February 23rd at the Yeshiva University Museum, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, a beautiful examination of the ideas that came out of the Geniza is part of a new novel by Dara Horn. A Guide for the Perplexed is Horn's fourth novel, containing what Horn describes as a thriller story of a kidnapping alongside what may be the first fictional treatments of certain legendary Jewish figures. Horn recently stopped by TJC Studios for an interview, and here are the highlights. So this book, in a lot of ways, tries to, uh, tries to dig deep into some of the really basic issues of what do we believe and what do we remember and, and, and what is the foundation of, of our understanding of who we are. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, well, I should say on the surface, though, this book is actually a thrower. Um, it's uh, the story of a software developer named Josie Ashkenazi who creates uh, an app that records everything its users do catalogs it all according to their instincts, uses it to predict their future. Um, when I wrote this, you know, when I finished writing this about six months ago, it was fiction. Now, you know, it's Google Glass, Facebook Graph, the NSA. I mean, you know, I, it's hard to stay ahead of the curve. Um, so right, she, technology yes. changes so fast <laughs> that if you're yes. writing about the future, it, it yes, might come up and creep up on you. Exactly. So um, she uh, has a sister who's very jealous of her. And um, who, per when she's invited to take a, a digital consulting job for a couple weeks in Egypt, she doesn't want to go. Her sister per persuades her to go. While she's there in Egypt's post-revolutionary chaos, she ends up getting kidnapped, uh, which allows her sister to take over her life at home. So there is this like thriller plot um, that's you know that goes throughout the book. And at this, and and throughout this, what what you're also doing in novelizing the uh, the these important historical moments where. Solomon Schechter discovers the Cairo Geniza, and uh, it, it, there's an immensely beautiful chapter where you, where you kind of discuss him pouring through these documents and, and then finding kind of the most magical connection, which is just reading the, the actual handwriting of Maimonides. Um, and then Maimonides, and, and what did Maimonides feel? How did you approach that? Well, so I, as you mentioned, yes, of course, Solomon Schechter and uh, Maimonides are characters in this novel. and. 
I did that with a lot of trepidation because, especially, uh, especially Maimonides, um, who sort of is now more—he's more a concept than a person. Um, but what I found is uh, they there is <laughs> depends <laughs> whose concept. Of yeah, course, yeah, well the yeah. concept varies from person to person, right, but right. in a, a series sense, of concepts. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to to in some way breathe life into these people, um, and to sort of because we think about them as as a mind in a sense, as an idea, and but an idea comes an, in a sense an idea comes from an emotion. And when you look into the lives that they lived, there's sources for that emotion. Um, the episode that I have uh, it w involving Maimonides is very much related to material that um, we found out from the Cairo Geniza. As you said, there was very little known about Maimonides' biography, and there still is very little known. But what we do know came from the Geniza, and um, some of the things that we know are that he had a brother who was a merchant involved in trade with India who drowned in the Indian Ocean. Um, and it, this was someone to whom he was very close, who he lived with. He ended up caring for his widow and his, and his niece. Um, so these are, this was a tremendously emotional moment in his life that preceded his writing of A Guide for the Perplexed. And when you read A Guide for the Perplexed, you see this sort of really poignant tension in his desire to believe in a just world and his desire to believe that God is just and that God is, and that God is protecting us in some way. And he has these sort of intellectual gymnastics to explain how that happens. And I think that so much of that legacy comes from this tremendously painful personal experience that he had that really in so many ways defined his life. And that was one of the things I wanted to explore in this book. You can see the full interview with Dara Horn in the Interviews category under TJC Original Series on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the On Demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.